Astro Imaging Primer. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Always oh, great to be here. All the spring stop party. I've been coming like this since this whole process started. But let's get into the media. I've been taking pictures of the stars on there since 1987. As a matter of fact, let me go. I go back to film, okay? And back then, the tool of choice was the OM1 camera body. And it was, you know, and it, it, was a, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. You didn't know how much of a challenge it was. You got into the digital age, how, how much simpler the whole process began. But let me give you a couple of stories. And Deb remember this. And that's my wife, Deborah, right there. And she's always uh, checking on me when I'm out in the wee hours of the morning, looking at the stars or whatever. But this was doing one of Ma's opposition. And so, you know, set up. Set up that particular night, you know, great night. It was just outstanding, you know. It's going to be a great night. You know it's going to be great. You feel it, you feel it, right? So I'm setting up. I got, the, you know, OM1. I think I'm shooting 200 ISO film. And I'm clicking away. And I know I'm getting some good shots. You know, you know, hat trick. You put the hat in front of the account, you know, telescope. But back, you know, and I'm going on and on. I, I'm feeling good about it tonight. <laughs> so we get in about one o'clock in the morning, you know. I think I got enough images. I should have, you know, some good images out of this roll of film. Because of course shooting film, you always you, you didn't know. You just didn't know. So I'm packing up, you know, breaking the equipment down and I begin to rewind the film on the camera. Right? Switch it over to rewind it. And I'm rewinding and there's not much tension. <laughs> 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 but you know, I'm sitting here rationalizing. Well, Tim Tools changed, maybe the mechanics and the cameras changed a little bit, you know. I'm sitting here, you know, hoping for the best. So I'm winding away and I'm not feeling that reassuring snap at the end. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I go and go and I said, well, Maybe something else is going on here, but let me just take it in a dark area over this thing up, just in case. So I take it inside, go to the laundry room, you know, this enclosed area, fill it with it, pull the thing up, pop it open, I, you know, flip the camera out for the cameras to fall out. <laughs> There was no film in the camera. <laughs> no film in the camera. So, you know, and so, you know, out of woes of film, okay? And you run in, and that was some of the issues with film. Film was uh, the only medium for a long time. But, you know, and you learn to work around it. You took copious amounts of pictures. And if you got one, maybe two good images, you were considered lucky, okay? And then came along the digital age. Ah, life became better. You understand me? Just exponentially better. So, you know, at this point, you got all these different cameras. Uh, 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 SD has cameras. Everybody putting out cameras. So I tried my first digital camera was the SD uh, STV. It was a decent camera, black and white, but it gave you a good feel for, you know, the handling digital imagery. Resolution wasn't the best, you know, you could do something, but that's the early days. And then I heard of modifying, then it came up for the digital, you know, DLSR, uh, digital SLR. Well, I'm familiar with S, you know, SLR framework anyway. That, that, that's where I started with, you know, OM1. So I said, well, let me give that a try. Think, think about that in half Griffin, I think was on modifications of these cameras where it would be a lot more sensitive to, you know, the really end up spectrum they were actually removing a field in there. And have, just have to have one he was selling, I think, for 350 bucks that he had modified the whole camera body. I said, well, this, uh, this is a chance. So I, you know, took the plunge, got the camera, and off I began this trail of uh, digital imaging. Now, I even have to go back and look for them because the telescopes they were designing at the time, most telescopes were designed for visual use back then. My camera, my equipment, 
pretty vintage equipment, you know. And it was designed for visual. So first thing you find out real quick when you hook a digital camera up is the corner around it. You know, you don't have a real flat field. I was shooting initially with an 11 inch Celestron and at native F10, it was great for looking at faint fuzzes, but if you wanted to get the broad field, it, it was just useless, okay? If you were trying to correct all this look, trailing dots around the edge. I said, well, I really like the wide field stuff, so let's try something else. So about this time, Astro Technology was coming out with these small 66 millimeter refractor. Great little scope. So I made a plunge again, price, you know, very affordable. So I try one of those. Now I'm satisfied with the feel of the V on that, but even the feel is even worse, okay? And then I said, well, that's okay, but I need, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Goldilocks saying that. The 11 inch was kind of too hot. The 66 millimeter was too cold. And then AT came out with an 8 inch uh, imaging Newtonian. Just right. Okay. And that's, and that's my primary tool right now. I use the 8 inch, 11 inch, uh, 8 inch imaging Newtonian F4 with the modified, you know, uh, Canon XT. So with that, I had to, of course, you still need to correct for, you know, that, get that flat field, so get by all these accessories. Now I'm giving you an abbreviated, abbreviated story that has occurred over about five years, okay? So you get everything right now. Of course, you're gonna take deep style, you got a guide, okay? So now you're getting the <coughs> auto guide, so. I decided, what do we do? I've been looking at this, looking at I know pretty good at polar line, you know, the zero drip, and I can guide with a good polar line with my mind for about three minutes without much problem. The three minutes just wasn't enough for what I wanted to do. So I, again, I take the plunge, go to Orion, get there, star guide, star shooter, and put the PH, what is it, PH, push it down to the PhD, Press here, yeah. So, <laughs> so now that, that is my system right now. I'm running all of this on a CI 700 O Celestron German equatorial mount, which I love. Very sturdy mount. I don't, you know, I'm torn between the go to. I kind of like the the fun of going after with setting service rather than go to. That's part of the, you know part of the game, probably, if you will. You know, you got to put a little sport and fun in. So, you know, I stick with that, right, it's a good mount, have it out there in the truck, and hopefully it clears off the night, we're gonna go up on the field, we're gonna do some wide field images tonight. But what I, what I wanna talk about, just wanna give you a real quick overview of what I'm doing, but what do you do when you wanna get started with this? And first thing you gotta decide, what do you wanna shoot? What do you wanna shoot? There are real small, faint fuzzies out there. There's the planets, of course, and then there's, everything in between. So, you know, and it takes, a, it, it, the equipment's look different for each one, you know, planetary, and you know, that, that's, that's, that's a whole nother animal. I just published, put, put up a picture of Saturn just a few days ago, and everybody told me I had to get Saturn. It was a Saturn picture right there, you know. And I hate when people say it was a good picture, but if some drink is an idea, so I'm giving them a good tour of the solar system. We start off with the solar system, and we're going on and on and out, you know. So they were out there helping me do this. So this was their shot, okay? But again, it takes, a, you know, to get that super quality uh, planetary image, you know, you, you take these little, these little, for lack of a better term, you start off with a little webcam, doing that, you take multiple frames, and then you stack all of that. And what I was doing was, again, use my old uh, Canon XT, and I shot, I think, 50 frames of Saturn. And out of those 50, because this, that particular magazine was pretty lousy, I think I was able to salvage three shots out of that, stacked them in register, and ended up with the image I had. I'll <coughs> show it to you a little bit later. But you gotta decide what you wanna shoot. For me, I still like the, the, the wide field, nebulous, and things of that nature. I think they are most appealing to me. 
I like to shoot where they are just a little bit underexposed. Again, you know, Astro Infinite, when we were doing Astro Photography back when I began, you were happy with anything. Now we got a little Astro <coughs> and you can play with it a little bit. I like it a little underexposed. Can I give you an idea if I was out in deep space and looking out across and have that in my field of view, what would it look like? And you know, I kind of play that little thing in there. Sometimes you can brighten it up or whatever, but you know, you blow out some parts of the image and some images you under. So I like that. And you'll see some examples of that. This particular image was a moon and Venus conjunction a few weeks ago. And I wanted to catch the earth shine in that. So I had to, you know, blow out, you know, part of the moon that was reflecting the sunlight before Venus down here, you know, it's all, you know, appears to be a disc, but you know, I got what I was looking for, and that somebody else should never make one of something a little different, okay? And then, you know, you have that, I guess, artistic latitude in taking it. But that's the first thing, you have to decide what you're gonna take, okay? And then, you, whatever you're gonna decide, you need to become familiar with your equipment. I can't emphasize that enough. You want, you want to go out and play with that equipment and just, to the point where it's second nature to you. You want to be able to operate that equipment in the dark. You want to be able to know what that equipment's going to do. You want to be able to predict what it's going to do. And just, it should become second nature to you. And that takes some time, you know, and to do that, you have to go out often. And as Deb will tell you, I'm out pretty much every clear night, you know. And she's always worked on me getting too cold. <laughs> you know, I call my little thermal nuclear reactor because every time I come in and I'm uh, there's a block of ice to get in bed, she warms me up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's coming in. <laughs> oh, she's coming in. <laughs> 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 Somebody like, found a use for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very handy. We've been out all you know for about four hours and it's you know, 30 degrees outside. I look forward to hot flash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of, you know, once you get all of that, then you want to start taking images, or you want to really begin to consider taking images. Now, what kind of camera are you going to use? I'm, for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on the Canon, you know, XT, which again, I like because I was familiar with that format, and it was just a natural transition from the OM-1 camera body to, again, another SLR camera body. So, uh, and there's certain things about it. One thing, what are your conditions around where you're going to shoot, okay? Now, I don't know how many of you live in suburban areas, uh, you know, very rural areas. Myself, I live just five miles south of beautiful downtown Franklin, and I have a circle of oval about like that over here where I got dark skies, okay? So neither I'm fighting, you know, fighting that. So, you know, you need to consider, are you gonna use some type of light pollution filter? I do, I use the astronomic SCL, CLS filter, which does a great job, but using that filter, you gotta adjust your white balance in your camera to get things right. Didn't know that, you know, part of the learning curve. I put the, you know, the filter on my mind and everything, turned out a purple, you know. <laughs> I said, well, that's not right, you know. It looked definitely, one of my, my granddaughter loved it. She purple was afraid to color, okay? <laughs> but it just wasn't rendering me what I wanted to see. So, you know, you go in, you know, again, very simple to change these things in the camera, you know. You take, uh, you, know, you, you just change the white down. Set up a car, you shoot a white down with that filter in, shoot an image, use that as your white balance, you put that in there, and voila, even with the filter out, the infrared filter out of the camera, you have to set up custom white balance. Otherwise, everything is going to be red. It has this red heat. So, you know, I'm pretty good at that. Got that down, that so up. We keep, keep that, and I got three custom white balance I keep stored on the camera. I keep one for without the, you know, imaging filter, I have one for the CLS filter, then I have one for one of, actually it has, it has it's a great effect, but I bought a filter, a nebula filter from Bill Burgess, and I love that filter because it does 
So when you did eat, you need things with the light. So I keep that in. Actually, I use that for more terrestrial imaging than I do astral imaging. But it gets great effect when I have those three uh, white thousands stored on the camera. And once I have all that, we got to shoot flats, okay? How many of you with flats that you shoot now? I see Paul, man. You got to shoot the flats, otherwise you're going to end up with this big donut. In the, uh, There's software for that now. They got some <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> But I, I still like shooting and flats are difficult. The best flats are the twilight flats, okay? The twilight flats are a bird to catch without catching stars in it. Has been for me. I don't know what, what your luck has been. I gave up trying to do it. Yeah, well I what I did, I mimicked a got a board that mimicked the color of a, a twilight sky. And I shot that about that which at that time of the day when the light was low. Worked great, actually. 25 cent board from Walmart. Did a great job. Sky boots. So you want another idea? Yeah. Go buy a brand new T-shirt. Put it over the end of your telescope. That worked. That's what they. I read about that number. Well, and I tried that one time. It didn't it, 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 it use the sky. <laughs> yeah. As a light source. Use the sky as a light source. But it may have been my imagination, but I swear it looked like I was picking up the pattern of the good. fabric in mm -hmm. that and. Probably wasn't. I had that in my head, and I never could satisfy myself with it. So I threw that out. Okay. So uh, that's what I do for my flats. Then I decide on my target. Now, each scope you have a field of view. That field of view will vary from the 66, which can be over about one and a half by two degrees, to the 11 inch waist very small. So what do you want to shoot? What do you, again, I like the Michael Ryan's nebula, things of that nature. Anything from a degree down to about 25 arc minutes. That's the range I like to shoot in and that really works well with the uh, 8 inch F4 scope because it normally gives you an object that's fairly decent that you can see details and it very good process. I tried to shoot NGC 2903 a couple of nights ago, and it was about, it was just a little small for my satisfaction. I mean, you know, some people say, yeah, it was a decent image. I didn't like it, so I you won't never see that picture. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and that's what I try to shoot. If I'm shooting with the 11 inch, I guess. Some images in there I shot for the 11 inch, I think it was IC 349 around my Roca, the Pleiades, and I want to get that little nebula, if you will, sit right, right below the star that you, you, it's, you can't see it. You, you, literally, you can't see it. You know it's there, but it, you, you're not going to pull it out with the, I couldn't pull it out with the 8, because, you know, it just couldn't get tight enough resolution, so I had to use the 11 inch. And I was satisfied with that, and I have an image of that in this slide out, slides I'll show a little later on. But once you decide on that, then you get to the focus thing. Now see, focus was a killer with film, because you never knew how well the focus was until you got the film back. And if it was a transit event, you know, sometimes you just lost out, okay? But with digital, you can sit there and just tweak that focus until you get it just right in mind image folder. I have a test a test folder. And that's all I do. When I begin a run, I always check my collimation. Every time I have an opportunity to pick with you, turn and check the collimation. Every time. Because it's nothing no worse to go out and you got a thing you got a good run to find out that's all. But and it's real quick with the laser collimation, you just stick it in that snap five minutes, usually you're done. But what I like to do is really to get that focus just so tight, I'll actually blow that image up to about 80%. And 80% of a raw image coming out, that's huge, okay? Very, very large. And if I can get the stars on the edge round at 80% of the size, I got a pretty tight image, okay? And I was thinking, I did, I'm going to get my, almost ready to begin the imaging run. And that's the auto guider's turn. You know, you got to get the auto guider up and run. Now, that's a couple of sites out there, groups that 
talk about this PhD guiding and all that, and it's really, it make it, it make it sound a lot simpler than it is, okay? It is simple once you get your system tuned, okay? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a control system. So you got to tune the loop. And tuning the loop sometimes will vary from, you know, a few minutes uh, to you're just not going to get it that way. And a couple of nights ago, I had some issues, and I kept wondering what was wrong. You know, nothing I thought had changed. And I keep my mouth set up at home. I just covered at the end of the driveway simply because I, you know, I don't want to go through the old polar line with And I was fighting it and fighting and fighting it, you know, just about a half a pixel trail on the stars and it was just driving me nuts. And I said, well, nothing's changed. You know, uh, you're fooling with it. I kept fooling with the controls, tuning it, and I got it down to what it looked like it was really Tracking was still off just a little bit. And I was trying to, trying to understand what was causing it to give me that little bump there. And yesterday, as I was pulling the mountain down to bring it up here, I realized one of the grandkids had hit one of the legs and shifted my polar line just ever <laughs> so slightly. And that was enough to create problems. And it did. It really created not big problems, but it was a headache. They have helped me out one time with it. Had to do a little investigative work. She bumped it with a van, okay? <laughs> in the daytime or at night? In the daytime, but it shouldn't be in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> this is what causes hot flashes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just like me at home. <laughs> You know, I'm looking, I said, somebody, you know, I'm like, you know, somebody bumped my mouth. Who bumped the mouth? Who bumped the mouth? I mean, it's a great kid, no, Papa, I didn't do it. You know, everybody asked me, I said, Dim, you bumped the mouth? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I got there and looked on the try one the tripod leg, and there's a little bar that kind of matches the paint of her paint. <laughs> 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 I go to a van about that same height. <laughs> That's a little mark of paint that kind of matches my tripod leg. <laughs> I go in and I say, I asked again, did you bump my mouth? <laughs> and you heard the answer. I shouldn't be there to the tripod <laughs> But that was okay. No damage done. Actually, twisted it in some fashion where I put it back. It operated better. So <laughs> <laughs> we ought to hit it more often. Hit it more often. So, you know, it's fine turning him out with a hand. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Something slightly better than a hammer. Well, yeah, yeah, just slightly, you wow. know. But it worked. I'm not going to, you know, it came back better, you know. <laughs> so, you know, again, tuning that loop. Don't be deceived by the advertisements that you set that up and you press, you say go, and it's going to catalyze. Not gonna do it, okay? It's just not gonna do it. Just have a lot of patience and a lot of time. I'm blessed right now in the fact that I can go out every clear night and do these things. So I'm, I'm you know, and it, it is blessed because I do look, enjoy looking at the night sky and to be able to go out on any given night when it's clear is just a delight. Uh, I just wish I was younger because usually after about 12 o'clock, you know, I'm sitting there. At the Screen like this, you know. Mm -hmm. But once you get an auto guide, you can go in and take a nap too. Okay. <laughs> as long as she's not driving. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> I'm not married to it. <laughs> I'm going home after this. You're still in trouble. I'm in trouble. I stay in trouble anyway. But she understands, you know. She's been a big supporter of my astronomical endeavors for years. You know, she is my biggest fan, honestly. She, you know, she was raving about the Saturn picture and she showed all her friends and I was saying that picture was so ugly. <laughs> she gave me this lecture. She said, you need to go see a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you all working on and on and on. You know, this is a whole other discussion. You know? yeah. But, you know, we have fun. And she comes back, you know, when the weather's warm, and the bugs are not biting, <laughs> and the allergies are not bothering her, she'll come out there for a little while. <laughs>
But you know, again, get back to focus in there. You gotta focus, focus, focus. Once you get the focus on your your and you auto guided, you're ready to start, you know, catching light frames now. Yes. Are you using software for focusing? Or are you using masks? Uh, Actually, I'm just using what I'm just using my eye and looking at the monitor, blowing that image up, that test image up. And you know, I, I, I trust my we guys more than anything else. I, I trust my left eye more than I do my right eye, okay? <laughs> But that's, and that's what I do. You can use that software out there that's actually an automated process. You can do it. But I kind of do this on, I say on the cheap. Uh, I, my position is the more automated you make the process, the more potential bugs that are in the system to fight. And, you know, I like being able to go out and decide and I look up and say, you know, I think I'm going to shoot tonight. And right now, I can go out and set up and be ready to shoot in 20 minutes, okay? With any scope, I can use on, on my mount, I got a plate that I can put on the 11 inch, I can put the Quest on there, I can put the solar scope on there, and then I'm, I'm ready to go in 20 minutes. Hook up the cable, power it up, and I'm ready to go. Particularly if that polar line is good, you know? <laughs> So, no, I'm not using this software, Paul. I'm just doing it visual, and I'm, you know, pretty successful at that. You know, and I, again, you know, we all know the problem mirror flocking to older SCTs, you know, because again, these kind of these scopes weren't designed for imaging. They were pretty much designed for visual observation. That's the scopes they're coming out with now. Flatter fields, they got the mirror locked on it. They are designing these scopes for people to, you know, image with. But, you know, I got a perfectly good scope, it's about 12 years old, and, you know, I can live with that, okay? Since it's not my primary image scope, I've been thinking about it, but can't convince myself. You know, you know if it's another four or five years, I might sell myself on on the in depth flushes. And so, why don't you just do it? I said, well, you know, I just you know, I just can't see it right now. But you know, my system works. I'm familiar with it, so it's, I'm good to go with it. But then you begin to take your lights up, and that's when the fun begins. If you take your lights up, everything's working, your auto guide work. You can literally, you know, I used to like taking about two to three hours of lights up. Usually my sky won't allow, my horizon won't allow for much more than that. So I'll, you know, put it in an auto. I'll watch the first couple of frames come down, make sure everything's tracked. And I go in the house and watch a movie, fix a hamburger, you know. I won't take a nap because I don't spring back as much, you know. <laughs> Last time I did, as a matter of fact, it was that. Not this past winter of 2010, 2011. I had to scope up out there, and it was a clear night, actually a clear night, cold, probably about 25 degrees. A few clouds off on the northwest, but I set the scope up, tracking, going to the house, look at some late movie on TV, come back out, and there's snow. Six <laughs> inches of snow on the laptop, on the camera, <laughs> on everything, you know. Yeah. And, the, and the bad thing, I go, and it's still clear outside. <laughs> During that time, it had snowed. And it was, of course, it was cool enough that most of our way to blow it off the laptop. I wasn't worried about the scope and all as it was the laptop. I blew those dry snow off and blew the snow off, you know, scope and said, I guess I need to call it tonight, but you know, that's something to, you know, you need to check the weather for it. Yeah, see what, <laughs> look outside. Yeah, see, yeah, see what the radar's telling you. Know, anything here that you're away. So, uh, and normally, you know, you, like I said, I run, I like to run three hours, two hours, all depending on my horizon. Most of the some of the objects I really like shooting to the northwest, and I'm looking right back over Franklin there. I'm looking between the, I guess that's a hickory tree and my neighbor's uh, crab apple tree. So I got an area about like this, and I can get, you know, two and a half hours out of that. Okay? I can look at any portion of my, from my spot and tell how many hours I've got before I, you know, get this meridian, I do the meridian flip. And before it gets into the pin oak over here on the other side, you know, I gauge everything by the trees in the, in the yard. So, you know, so what I do, I have, 
after that, you know, I'll go out and I'll begin to, you know, got all the lights up. You know, I try to catch anywhere from, I like 300 second lights up. Okay, you know, I get, you know, five minutes. I like to get anywhere from 24 to 36 of those. And once I'm satisfied, you know, I, you know, I got all the subs and I'll go through them real quick before I break down, make sure all of them, are, you know, I, most of them are decent. Sometimes you get because of periodic error, you get a little bump in some. You know, you discard those. Oh, generally speaking, I will discard the ones that don't like. Then I will begin the process, uh, post imaging process, and I'm, as I'm taking my equipment down, okay, that is, I'll begin to convert the images over and all that. Now, there's several software packages out there. I use I use Images Plus, okay? Like software, it's very intuitive. It, they provide a great video tutorial with it, and you can just really get a handle on it. Now, this book, Handbook of Astronomical Imaging Process, great book that explains all the processes, you know, involved in that, the nomenclature, everything about it. It's in three sections. There's one that's very basic section, there's one that's very detailed, and then there's another section, again, going over all the same stuff that's kind of an application. But I would recommend, if you're going to get into astral imaging seriously, get this book. As a matter of fact, it actually sells software, which I never used for you know, processing images because it was just too cumbersome for me. It just wasn't intuitive. Not like Images Plus. But the book is outstanding. You know, if you're going to do imaging, keep, you know, you need one for your library, okay? Because there's terms in there that you may not be familiar with, and fairly, you know, new terms of, you know, just astral images. And it kind of, it kind of guides you through that and give you really a great tool for deciding how you want to process your image, okay? But after I've given, you know, go through this process, I'm going, breaking the book on process images process and you know and then I get to the point where I have to align the images and you know I'll pick up the stars and then do all of that and hopefully if I got 36 images I got 36 of them that'll correlate sometimes it's 34 because I got one that's did a little bump or something and when I, you know when, at that point you home free then you know you got you know 35 or 36 images, images correlated and they're gonna stack those images are gonna stack up they're gonna stack up very nice so, you know, at that point, that's when you get excited because you know you're going to get some good data. So, at that point, you know, you go up to another screen where you actually combine and stack. We've got different methods of doing it. You can go there. It's, it's about eight different methods in one. Some are better for, you know, less noise. Uh, some you'll pick a lot more noise. You get cars with gray heads and things. So, you know, you have, again, you've got to play with them, okay? And usually what you do once you get your images correlated, Save that data because then you can combine it using these different methods. If you don't like one method, just go back to the you know translating rotated images and try another method of combining them. Just play with it. It helps play with it because the result will vary depending again on the object that you're shooting. So you know, I say keep all your data, keep the raw data that comes off the camera, and if, once you get the images correlated keep those images, okay? At that point, you can do a lot of things without having to go through the whole process again. So, you know, you correlate it, you combine them, you come out with this image, and you stretch it, and then you're looking to see, you know, it's always that moment of anticipation when you begin to stretch it to see what it looks like. And it's either a mm moment or a wow moment, okay? And there's usually nothing in between. Now, let me see. I'm going to run some of my images up here. And this is a, again, I actually shot that using a tripod. Uh, the center part 
Is all this taken with your eight inch Newtonian now? Huh? All this taken with your These are all taken with eight inch Newtonian and seven and eleven. That's a that's a Jupiter picture from years ago. Oh yeah, triple. You can tweak it with, again, images plus, you know, at that point it becomes more of an, an artistic touch to it, if you will. And you know, depending on your life now, actually seeing it there and seeing it on this screen versus my desktop at home, I use and process all the images on the desktop. And I had them all on one fold and went off and forgot them. So I had to kind of tweak these on this one and make it give you something to show, okay? I realized that when I looked on him and I'm looking for a folder, and I, that's the problem getting old. You just don't remember where you put things. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember where I had it on this machine or the desktop, and I was looking on it, looking at it, you know, just prior to coming over here, and I said, you know, I guess that was on that machine. But anyway, yeah, any questions right now? Yes. Hey, when you have a filter on there, do you have to increase your exposure time? Yes. Yes. Is there a set formula for that, or are you just kind of trial and error? You know that there are set formulas for that, but you know, there's so many variables in that. You know, again, you got your light pollution around where you are. You know, you have, you know, what you're seeing that night. You, you know, whether it's hazy. So for me, it's I try to, I try to shoot with filter all the time. And I try to shoot with 370 subs, so usually that will, you know, satisfy the equation. I try to keep it simple. I try to keep it fun for myself. Are you doing dark frames too? Yeah, I do, I do shoot dark frames. I shoot warm weather darks, cold weather dark, cool weather darks. So you got set already? Already, you know, set the darks all ready to go. You use the same library all the time for those circumstances? Yes. Like I said, cool weather, like I said, I got the warm weather, that's my summertime darks, cool weather, my wintertime darks, you know, so, and I got, you know, of course, the 300 second darks, and I got uh, five minutes set of darks, three minutes set of darks, two minutes set of darks, you know, so I got a whole library of just darks. With the chip and the electronics aging, how frequently do you update the sets? Uh, annually. Okay. I do it annually. I do this, I, I'm due for us. Some set, as soon as the weather gets warm enough, I'll go out and do a summer set of darts. Yeah. But like I said, I, I love the camera. 
again, for me, it's a lot. It's just intuitive for me. That's what I started off with was the O in one camera body. So it's just, it's just the natural. And like I said, they have a multitude of cameras out there. You know, the cool camera. They have cameras, and they said my camera's an old camera. They have cameras a lot. You know, not nearly it has as much noise. So you know, you know how deep the pocket it is, and you know, and just how much you wanna, how much time you wanna put into it. When you say it's modified, what what is modified about it? What's modified about it as in most uh, digital SLR has filters in it, <coughs> infrared filter, actually, and they remove that. Okay, it's a blocking filter, and they remove that. Okay, so the camera and the chip become a lot more sensitive to the red end of the spectrum. So that, and that's how, and that's the modification. They, do. they put in a clear piece of uh, something that you know, glass, for lack of a better term, but that kind of opens the spectrum of your camera so yeah. But then you can you can put another infrared filter on there. Yeah they do have the little uh floppy clip in filters now that you can you know put it actually into the camera and it'll do the same thing you can put different filters in you can put your you know your O3 or your hydrogen alpha you know you can you know the narrow narrow field Filters you can put those in there as well. Or you can use, you know, I use two inch filters mm -hmm. so again. I had some, so that was just a natural. I just threw that on. So, what kind of lens do you use? Or, what kind of, uh, uh, are you, you're, not, you're not shooting through the scope itself, are you? Yeah. You are. Yeah. This is prime, prime focus in. Okay. What's the camera again? Which one? It's the Canon, Canon XT. The 300? Yeah, 300, same okay. as the brand. With, with the camera, when you have it modified, are you saying that it's the same thing in like it's Photomax companies that just make an infrared camera and it's the same modification? No, no, no. Um, the infrared filter is a protective filter that goes over the chip in the camera. Yeah. But it also blocks the IR so your images don't look funny. Yeah. So you don't want to take that same camera and go take a daylight picture with it. No, it's not. <laughs> well, you could. You can, I've done, you know, but it's like I said, it's, it's not, no. Well, if, if you do a custom white balance, you get a fairly decent picture. Can you still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you used it? Yeah, I have. Huh. I have. Like I said, again, it goes over that custom white balance, and you get a fairly decent image. Have you got a feedback out of that new Canon 60D8? You know, they just announced that what, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Have not heard anything yet, and I just I don't know. That's some as as the naysayers said. Well, why do that when you can do this? You're gonna spend that kind of money. Why don't you just spend your money on a dedicated astro imager? Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I I, I, I really don't know. And it's good for because that camera's gonna sell for what seventeen hundred. Seventeen hundred. Well, you start talking about that kind of money, you might want to consider a kind of dedicated, you know, designed for that purpose. And this kind of, it is kind of designed for it in that body, but there are cameras that are cool cameras. When I say cool, they're thermoelectrically cool, and that are designed for astro imaging that you can get with that kind of money, you know. So, you know, it's a, well, it's if I have to replace my camera, I, it's going to be, I'm going to have to really look at it hard. I mean, are you comparing that to like a CMOS or a CCD or? I think that's a CMOS. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a personal call and again, just what, whatever you're comfortable with. I just wonder if anyone was getting any feedback. I don't, I don't know, I don't even, I know they announced the camera, I don't know if, I haven't read anything on any feedback as far as how well the camera I don't think it's actually hit the mark, and I think people are taking orders for the camera. I know all of that. Because I've got somebody sending me an email and said, hey, you know, we can pre order your camera, but I don't think the camera is you know, out there in the field yet to answer the question. So it's going to be interesting to see. Probably, but it wouldn't know. be any different than you going out and buying a 60 d and sending it off and having the work done. Right. Right. The difference right. is you just buy it off the shelf. Right. So you keep it. Definitely, you get you get, a, you get the camera warranty, you have it modified, warranty is the old one, okay? And that's, that's the problem. You get a 60, 
cease to be. Every matter of fact, that warrant is void. And the void is the warrant. So, uh, it's totally the way I'm too much adapted. Yeah, because yeah, I didn't know if the key dudes had internal threads in the They do have them. internal threads, but if you use those internal threads to the field, then you don't have anything to call for to the you know, camera with. I mean, I guess you could, but the field has you know, just a small set of threads, but usually I put the two-inch barrel into the T, and then I put my field on that. Yeah. I would like to capture some of the nebulosity in the plates. Okay. If I try to do that tonight, using the film camera, about how long would the exposure be? Or is this if the sky night is good enough? Well, what kind of lens you got to do? That's because it's going to be what? What's your optical triangle? Um, it would be a 5 inch refractor. 5 inch refractor at, at F4. At H. F8. Using a I would probably start off with a, this is with a big length play these. I'd start off with a one, eight, one, inch, uh, one minute exposure and see what it does for you. I think you're going to be surprised what you can capture in one minute. Yes, sir. I like to go on Night Skies Network and do broadcast. Have you ever experienced that with somebody using a DSLR and doing some type of, some kind of live type of stream of that? So bright outside, even with the computers, but it was hard to see the detail. So we, we did that. Did it. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Cool. It could be very, you know. Any more questions? Well, hopefully, the sky's going to get away. We're going to get something. <laughs> We're going to do something. Like I'm going to do wide field, I'm going to shoot, but. Uh, with just a camera lens tonight. So I normally get the tight polar line that I would need. It would take a night to hold our line and then we shoot. So I can we'll, we'll shoot something. We just get it, it'll be after 10 o'clock, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Because I really want to do some wide field imaging in this location anyway. I rarely get to go to a dark sky site. I'm always fighting. Now I zoom in. North, south, east, west, and west. I'm excited about tonight. That's because he won't know. I've wanted that. I wanted to move back. Just 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 internet <laughs> 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 they're gonna hear you that. too when you're sometimes, talking. sometimes I don't think she's interested and the fact of that is she she's been we've been married for a long time hey dad did you learn how to push your eyes right we dated for six years prior to that, and I've been watching Slav this whole time. So she's pretty accustomed to it, and sometimes she just don't get as excited as I would like for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I just cut a little slack. You know, she she seems more than the average person. And, you know, it takes a lot to impress her with this. So when she gets excited, you know, I'm touched. You know? <laughs> So, uh, you know, a, a next big opportunity will for the transit of Venus, you know. So I've been racking my brain as to how will I shoot the transit of Venus, and I think I got a scenario set out. I think I'm going to shoot with, shoot, uh, with the Quest Star. That should, of course, I should work real well for that, particularly for that time of the day. And then I'm going to probably shoot, probably have them on the same platform, Shoot with the PST as well. 
Let's see what I can do. Um, a little camera set up. This should be interesting then. You have a little telecompressor for the PSD? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. You know, I just keep myself kind of flexible because, you know, sometimes, you know, they just look just on smile on you man, doing these events. You know, we can end up with something like, oh, yeah, I need to be ready to travel, you know, three, four hundred miles. So this is it. We don't see it this time. It's you know, a long way. We got a long way. I have to tell my grandkids to remind their grandkids to look at it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and thank me when they do. When they do. <laughs> but again, thank y'all for listening. And uh, thank Lord. I've known Lord for Lord myself. We met up oh, geez, a long, long time ago. I guess up that die and. That was back in the 80s, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, we go back along with Lord, Mike Benson, and Dudley. Dudley, I was talking to Dudley, his son actually was taking an interest in the spine, and he's going to break out the uh, five inch uh, AP. Yeah. Again, you know, he had that just thing out of the box for, for years, you know. But he's looks like he's getting ready to get up again. So, yeah, you know, we kind of old game years ago. Years ago. So I, anytime, you know, I think a lot, you know, Lord has done a lot for us. I read not only for BSAS when we were there, but for the National Bombers Society. You know, who just, let's give them a round of applause. Bring it here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, you know, he's, he's, and he has some great equipment. Crazy. I guess that was, what's that? Was that a 16 or 18 inch dog you had here? 20. Yeah, the 20-inch dog, yeah. Well, that's what I've got tonight. Yeah, so, you know, this, you meet a lot of great people in this hobby, you become friends for, you know, life. Uh, you know, I enjoy, Herb, I've known, and, and Her Herb and myself even go back farther than that, you know. They during the early days of, you know, BSA and stuff that down there in Brentwood and stuff, so, you know. It's just a good thing to get back and see a lot of the people every year and reminisce and, you know, as we watch this whole hobby that we chose as it, you know, we move into the 21st century with it, you know, and it, it's, it's been exciting because you, you go back to film and, you know, the old, you know, hat trick in front of the camera, you know, telescope, you know, we've come a long way. And I'm looking for, you know, the next 10 years to even more, be more exciting. You know, we're actually cranking out pictures, photographs that rival what they were doing with some of the larger observatories, you know, 20 years ago. You know, people are doing this from the backyard, you know, with ease and grace. So, what can you say? They discovered extra solar planets. Oh, yeah. yeah it's just, it's amazing. So, again, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Huh? The guy over there. The guy over there.